and we must move on to questions to the Minister of Enterprise, Trade and Investment. And before we proceed, uh, just to inform members that question nine has been withdrawn. I call Mr. Fergal McKinney. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Question number one. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Attracting large-scale internationally mobile television and film production to Northern Ireland is a vital component uh, to growing the local film industry. At the end of March 2014, I met with Senior Vice President of the Walt Disney Corporation, Mr. Jerry Ketchum, to discuss the potential for his organisation to film in Northern Ireland for the first time. Mr. Ketchum was in Northern Ireland with his Executive Vice President, Mr. Tony Toe, on an official visit organised by Northern Ireland Screen. I am advised by officials that the visit went very well and the company is very keen to work in Northern Ireland in the near future. You will also be aware that my ministerial colleagues met with Mike Lombardo and his team at HBO during their recent visit to the United States. We are very confident that HBO will shortly announce that Series 5 of The Game of Thrones is to go ahead again at Belfast Titanic Studios. Growing the independent production sector is critical to the future success of the local industry and recently I met with uh, the respective production teams from the BBC's Blandings and the film Miss Julie. I was impressed by how well filming had gone for them in Northern Ireland and the level of support they had received from Northern Ireland screen. Well, Mr McKinney for supplementary. Thank you very much Mr Principal Deputy Speaker and can I welcome the news of the recent over £40 million uh, announcement by Detty in terms, of the, uh, in terms of the industry. Typically the industry gathers pots of money together uh, and accumulate that towards an end product and to that end uh, uh, can the Minister outline this year any discussions with uh, both the British and Irish governments in terms of promoting uh, the industry and supporting it across the island? Well, in terms of uh, our own government, uh, the UK government have uh, actually taken great steps forward in terms of tax credits, and it's one of the things that we talked about with Walt Disney when they were here, the fact that it had become uh, a very good place uh, to invest in, in terms of production. Uh, and it's one of the reasons why Northern Ireland Screen are looking to again increase uh, what they are doing. Uh, the whole taxation uh, piece is very important for these kinds of productions, as he will recognise. And of course, if there are opportunities to work with the Republic of Ireland's government, we will do so uh, as well. Uh, the screen industry here uh, have really developed uh, very strongly over this past uh, three to four years. And it's not just in large scale production. Uh, but of course in other areas of production as well, which I'm sure he's more familiar with than maybe some of the other members, uh, entertainment, factual, uh, but also in animation. And uh, we're very much wanting to encourage others to look at Northern Ireland in particular for the skill sets that we are now developing in and around all of uh, uh, the production uh, and Northern Ireland screen work that has been going on. So very good news story uh, and we seek to grow it even further. And I call Mr. Peter Weir. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Principal Speaker. I'll try and be sort of be animated then in my uh, supplementary in that regard. The Minister made uh, reference to the discussions with HBO. I wonder if you could provide us an update on the agreement between HBO and Tourism in Ireland and what the implications of that agreement will be. Well, this uh, again is very good news because I think it's the very first time uh, that HBO have engaged in this sort of uh, agreement uh, with a partner like ourselves and like Tourism Ireland. Uh, and essentially, Tourism Ireland and HBO are going to capitalise on what has been a worldwide uh, success in terms of Game of Thrones. And after six months of detailed negotiations, uh, we will be able to access uh, all of their Facebook and Twitter feed uh, to reach their fans right across the world. So I think that's a, a tremendous endorsement of their work here in Northern Ireland, and it allows Tourism Ireland to show off uh, the areas where uh, they film Game of Thrones, which actually, for some people in this house, they may not realise it, is actually happening right across Northern Ireland. Um, from the Marble Arch Caves, which of course I want to talk about, uh, but also right up to the North Antrim coast, down to Castle Ward. All of those areas are going to be covered uh, in this uh, publicity. So it's a really, really good news story uh, and one that I hope we can see benefit from. Yeah, Mr Barry Michael Can I commend the Minister and the other Executive Ministers for their efforts in promoting the film industry? And, uh, the Minister has referred to the global success of the Game of Thrones. Has she any further thoughts uh, on how to promote the film locations in terms of their potential as tourist attractions? She made some reference to that in her last answer. 
Well, obviously, the, the work that we're doing with HBO in terms of Game of Thrones will be very important. Uh, the Northern Ireland Tourist Board are also, and Tourism Ireland, working with uh, the uh, National Trust uh, because they, of course, were the setting for the film Miss Julie, uh, which I understand has been considered for Cannes, which, uh, if it happens, will be a tremendous endorsement as well of what has happened here. Uh, I know everybody in the chamber watches Blandings on a Sunday evening, uh, and they will have seen the fabulous uh, views of Crum Castle there as well. Again, that's something that we intend to use in terms of our tourism uh, potential. So there has been a great uplift in terms uh, of this sector helping another sector, the tourism sector, and we intend to grow that as the years go on. Ms. Sandra Overland. Thank you, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker. And, and just in, in reference to, I mean, the fourth, the fourth series of the Game of Thrones, uh, due to be filmed here, and the major increase in the budget for Northern Ireland Screen, is the Minister content that the skills in the creative industries and the support and the supporting roles, uh, no pun intended, are here in Northern Ireland? And uh, what discussions has she had with the Minister for Employment and Learning uh, to extend training in this sector? Well, I, I am content that we do have the skills here, and, and that is endorsed by the fact that we have had uh, people come and invest, whether it's in animation or in other uh, factual or entertainment series, um, The Fall, In the Line of Duty. All of those firms have found um, the skills that they need when they come uh, to Northern Ireland, so I am content that those skills are there. If we move up to the next level, obviously we will need more people to get involved in uh, this sector, uh, and therefore uh, we will need to engage with uh, the local colleges uh, in particular, uh, and I know that the Minister of Employment and Learning will work with me to make sure that we have the appropriate skills learning, because that's the advantage of Northern Ireland. The fact that we can be flexible uh, when opportunities arise, it's one of the strongest selling points for Northern Ireland, and I think we should look forward to the opportunities that this sector will provide for us uh, over the coming months and years. I think it's a very exciting time for Northern Ireland. I know that Northern Ireland Screen uh, have an ambition uh, to be the largest um, production area in the UK and Ireland outside of London. I think that's something we can really achieve, and that would be a great fillip for Northern Ireland. Thank you. And I call Mr David Hilditch. Thank you, Mr Principal. Deputy Speaker, question two. Compliance with European Commission obligations on emissions is a key issue for our large-scale generators. The Commission has also called for coordination of trading arrangements for electricity markets across Europe. This rule will require redesign of existing market arrangements and consideration of how generators will participate in and be remunerated under new structures. Work on the market redesign is progressing and the generators have opportunities to input into the process. For a supplementary. Thank you, Principal Debbie Speaker, and thank the Minister for her answer. Uh, Minister, how important is the North Safe Interconnector for long term uh, security of supply? Well, I am on record as saying the North-South Interconnector is critical for uh, our long-term security of supply. Uh, that's still my position. As I understand it, NIE have resubmitted uh, its revised planning application and environmental impact assessment to the Department of the Environment, and uh, we're hopeful that we can now progress in relation to the North-South Interconnector to deal with uh, the issues that we know are in front of us. It's not something we aren't aware of the consequences of. Uh, we know fine well uh, that we have a pinch point of 2016 and indeed of 2021, and therefore we need to progress with the North-South Interconnector. I call Mr. Cahill Boylan. I approve last inquiry. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. We could ask the Minister does she not agree that greater cooperation across the island is needed to deliver energy? Um, and could I also ask her what discussions has she had with her southern counterpart in relation to delivering this for the future? Well, the last conversation I had with Pat Rabbit was in relation to the North South Interconnector and the fact that we absolutely need it to, put, uh, to be put in place. And he is very clear that he needs it put in place. I'm very clear that we need it in place to make the single electricity market work to the benefit of everybody, both in Northern Ireland and in the Republic of Ireland. So I think it is uh, a very strong story uh, in terms of North South cooperation because we want the North South Interconnector to happen. Well, Mr. Alban McGuinness. Um, uh, thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker, and could I thank the Minister for her answers. I, I, I share the view of the Minister that this is very, very important for the development of the electricity industry throughout uh, Ireland. Uh, could the Minister indicate um, 
whether or not there is a time or a, a date indicated, uh, even a speculative date at this stage, in relation to the public inquiry that would take place? Well, no, I can't, because as he will appreciate, that's a matter for his colleague, the Minister for the Environment. All I can do is urge him to deal with it in as timely a manner as he possibly can, and uh, I hope that that will be the case. Mr. Jim Allister. Does the Minister acknowledge that there is a looming crisis in terms of insufficiency of indigenous generated electricity, and how, if she does recognise that, what proposal has she to deal with that, particularly given the stalling of the interconnector? Well, what I do recognise is certainly the fact that, and I've already referenced it, that we will have an issue in 2016, and that is why the systems operator has put out a call uh, for additional generation, and uh, he will have uh, the answers to that call, as I understand it, by, I think it's the end of May. Um, and uh, if there's no interest in the market, and I don't believe that will be the case, then as he is aware, I have the powers to intervene in terms of generation. Uh, but I hope that the market will bring forward uh, different options uh, to deal with that point in 2016 when our capacity uh, buffer, if you like, is uh, 200 megawatts. At the moment, it's 600 megawatts. Uh, and therefore, we will be able to deal with the issue of 2016. Of more pressing problems will be 2021 if the North-South Interconnector isn't in place, um, because that will provide us with uh, a bigger issue then. And uh, obviously, we'll, whoever's in uh, my position in, in the years to come will have to keep a very close eye on that and take whatever uh, actions are necessary to make sure uh, that we have the security of supply in the short, medium and longer term. Thank you. And I call Dolores Kelly. Uh, thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Question three, Minister. Uh, the Prime Minister met with Taoiseach Enda Kenny last month at the Anglo-Irish Summit where they welcomed ongoing collaboration on visas to help strengthen the common travel area. The visa waiver scheme is an action point included in the Economic Pact which has been developed as part of the G8 Summit legacy to help Northern Ireland build a prosperous and united community. The Home Office continues to work with officials in the Irish Government to further secure the external common travel area border and that visa reciprocation is a part of this. Subject to appropriate safeguards, the United Kingdom Government will look to pilot a scheme permitting visitors from some destinations to enter the United Kingdom from the Republic of Ireland using an Irish visit visa without the need for a UK visa. Call Mrs. Kelly for supplementary. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for her uh, comprehensive answer. But given the impending vote uh, for Scottish independence, has the Minister had any indication of how that will impact on the uh, visa if Scottish people should vote for independence? Well, I would imagine that would be an issue for the Scottish uh, Parliament in that very hypothetical uh, situation. Um, I mean, from my perspective, what we're trying to do, as she knows, that we have a common travel area at the moment uh, between ourselves, the Republic of Ireland, the Isle of Man and the Channel Islands. Uh, what we were trying to do was that if people came in from faraway places like China and India into uh, the Republic of Ireland, that we could then attract them up into Northern Ireland. And that's the key element uh, to this. Um, and as I understand it, the rollout of biometrics is a, an absolutely key part of this. And um, once that the, uh, the Irish government has that in place, then things will be able to progress. Uh, and I think that will make a, a difference to us in Northern Ireland because we'll be able to attract people up, uh, particularly from Dublin. Call Mr. Ian McRae. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Can the Minister outline um, any new air routes that um, have been identified as being um, important to develop here in Northern Ireland? Well, again, this is one where there's no secrets. I've been very clear that I want to see a route from Canada developed, and I also have some key targets in terms of European routes as well, principally into Germany, and I would love to see a Brussels 
uh, connection from Northern Ireland as well. And I think it's something actually that would really help us in terms uh, of our influence in uh, Brussels if we had that uh, direct connectivity. But in the context of that, I do very much welcome the fact that in the Chancellor's budget uh, recently, he has again said he will look at uh, start-up aid for new routes from regional airports and uh, that sort of air route development fund which we have been prevented from developing uh, in Northern Ireland will of course be of uh, great help to us here because of our distance and uh, because of the fact that we are uh, uh, not on the mainland, that we are in, uh, on the island of Ireland. And I think that uh, we will want to explore that with the Department of Transport as to how that uh, will develop and what benefit it can be to us. Uh, so that's ongoing discussions that we will be having with the Department uh, and it's something I think that will assist us in uh, getting new routes uh, into uh, our airports. I have already drawn attention to the necessity for supplementaries to address the original question and that was quite a long haul route, uh, a long way from uh, common travel visas. Uh, Mickey Brady. Cara, I got the uh, last Concordia. Um, I thank the Minister for answer so far. I think you've probably answered the question to some extent, but it's just work that has been done to identify the potential growth in this area when a solution is found. Cara, I got. Well, we do recognise that there has been a, a growth in uh, faraway destinations coming into the island of Ireland through Dublin, and we want to be able to attract those people to come up to uh, Northern Ireland. And, uh, in fact, just yesterday, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker, I attended the Meet the Buyer event uh, in Enniskillen. And uh, at that event, there were 120 tour operators from all across the globe trying to find out uh, about our product here in Northern Ireland, our experiences, and if we can attract more air routes directly into Northern Ireland, I think that will have a huge benefit for us. But they were very impressed with what we had to offer and the experiences we had available to them, and I'm hopeful that again uh, next year will be a good year for tourism in Northern Ireland. Thank you. And I call Mr. Danny Kinahan. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Question number four. The key strategic targets for tourism are contained in the Programme for Government and the Economic Strategy. The last couple of years have been highly successful for Northern Ireland tourism. My focus has been to deliver on the tourism product, uh, major events and global marketing campaigns to ensure success and bring maximum economic benefit to the local economy. I am delighted uh, with what has been achieved and it is now an opportune time to consider future plans. A review of the Northern Ireland Tourist Board and wider tourism structures is due to be completed by the end of May 2014. And when I have the recommendations from that review, I will take stock of the action needed to ensure we deliver on my and the industry's aspiration to grow tourism into a £1 billion industry by 2020. Okay, and I call Mr Kinahan for a supplement. Thank you very much, Principal Deputy Speaker, and I congratulate the Minister on much that ha has been achieved, um, but we really were looking forward to this report, which I think if I've gathered what you've just said correctly, we will get shortly on what's based on the consultation. Um, but does she see it as something that can really pull all of us together to help sell Northern Ireland, particularly Northern Ireland as opposed to the whole of Ireland? Well, as he will know, uh, my focus is always on how we can give standout uh, to Northern Ireland. Um, that has always been my focus and will continue to be my focus. Uh, I mean, the tourism uh, strategy is something that, frankly, we have moved on from. And um, I do remind the member that it was his leader that said we needed to move away from strategies and into action. Uh, and I think anyone looking at what has happened uh, in tourism over this past a uh, number of years will see, we'll have seen a lot of action in terms of the product we now have available, in terms of the events that we've been able uh, to bring here to Northern Ireland, and indeed a whole uplifting of the skills in the hospitality and industry, uh, tourism industry. So I think there has been a lot achieved. Uh, we should take pleasure from that, but we should plan for the future, and that's why uh, the uh, review of the Northern Ireland Tourist Board does come at an opportune time, and I'm looking forward uh, to that review coming to me at the end of May. Call Mr. Sammy Douglas. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Um, I've just come from the All Party Group on Tourism, where there's a um, major presentation on the Giro d'Italia and the tremendous opportunities there are for Northern Ireland. But can I ask the Minister, could you indicate whether to date tourism targets in the programme for government have been met? 
Well, and can I say to him that I was very pleased Stephen Roach was able to be with you at the All Party Group on Tourism because the Giro is now nearly upon us. There's a lot happening in terms of the world looking at Northern Ireland, and uh, I hope everybody's ready to wear pink, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, because it's hugely important that we're all in the pink uh, for May. Uh, as regards all PFG targets, um, in respect of the tourism commitments, they've all been met to date, uh, including key milestone, milestones for visitor numbers and tourism revenue uh, in 2012, uh, with 3.2 million visitors spending 539 million uh, up to September of last year, 2013. Uh, we are well on our way to meeting our uh, programme for government targets of 4.1 million visitors and 637 uh, millions of revenue. So I want to pay tribute to the Tourist Board, Tourism Ireland and all of the industry uh, for the way in which they have come together, uh, played it very well, one team, one voice, and I'm very pleased with the industry. Thank you very much. Mr. Pat Sheehan. I've got a free last corner. I've got to go and uh, would, would the minister, I thank the minister for her answers thus far, and I wonder, would the minister accept that our inability to deal with such matters as VAT on tourism products and uh, our passenger duty actually hampers our efforts to attract, attract the maximum uh, number of visitors to these shores? No, I don't accept that. And indeed, when we asked the Chancellor to intervene in terms of our passenger duty, he did so. Uh, and he, reduced the, he gave us the power to reduce the ban B to zero, and that allowed us to uh, have a very strong tool when we go out to look for uh, new flights of an international status and allowed us to keep the flight to Newark. Uh, in terms of VAT, of course, that is a reserved matter for the Parliament in Westminster, and I look forward to the day that his members take their seats and perhaps put forward an argument in terms of VAT. Call Mr John Dallet. Mr Principal Deputy Speaker, I thank the Minister for her answers and indeed uh, for her endeavours to develop uh, tourism in Northern Ireland in these more peaceful times. Uh, given that international tourists in particular do not recognise political borders and tend to migrate north and south, has she had in, any input into the tourism policy review which was announced in Dublin? Um, well, I, I will say this to the member. I was made aware of the policy review by the minister at the time that he launched it, but as far as I understand, uh, certainly I haven't been uh, involved in any policy development, and I don't believe any of my officials have either, but I stand to be corrected uh, on that issue. Uh, but he is, he is looking at his policy, whereas I am looking at structures in terms of the tourist board. So the two uh, are slightly different, uh, but certainly we do have a good working relationship, and uh, we always endeavour to work together when it's to benefit uh, both parts uh, of the island, as he will know in terms of the Rugby World Cup. Uh, which we are working on together uh, with the Minister for Culture, Arts and Leisure. Uh -huh. Invest Northern Ireland support and engagement with both North West stakeholders and businesses in the last three full financial years should by no means be viewed as a lack of investment. Between 2010-11 and 2012-13, InvestNI offered £27 million of assistance towards viable projects in the North West region, contributing towards a total planned investment in the area of £136 million over the same three-year period. This support promoted 2,404 new jobs and safeguarded 160 existing jobs. Start-up assistance was also provided to 1,298 Indigenous businesses through the Enterprise Development programme or regional start initiative. For Invest and I to be able to offer support, it is reliant on businesses approaching it with viable business plans to increase their competitiveness or gain a larger share of local and international markets. I would therefore encourage the member to recommend businesses uh, he is in contact with to engage with Invest Northern Ireland to see what help can be offered. Invest and I is often criticised also for not directing foreign investors to the North West. This is a point I have repeatedly clarified, but I will again. Invest and I cannot direct investment to specific geographical areas. It is the investor that chooses the location that best meets their needs. Well, Mr. Hoshin, for a supplement.
Uh, could I ask the Minister, does she recognise the disparity that exists even within the North West uh, area in terms of the constituencies, uh, where which help goes to the Fort constituency and less so to uh, West Tyrone and to the East Derry constituencies? Well, if there are divergencies between constituencies, uh, and I think uh, when he talks about the North West, it is Straban. Uh, Londonderry and Limavady that are taken into consideration in these figures. Uh, if there are uh, divergences, then we do rely on the local councils to work with us to work up plans to deal with those issues. Uh, I do have to say to them there are some very good plans, uh, and I think of the Inspire programme for one, which I know that the Straban Council has developed uh, with OMA Council uh, in terms of the local economic development programme, and indeed there are other very good programmes worked up alongside the councils as well. So it is a, a question of working together and not waiting for someone to come along uh, and offer a solution. This is about collaborative working, uh, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker, and I do hope that the member is up for that collaborative working. Thank you. And just before we go on to supplementaries, can I remind members that uh, there is a very specific reference to investment in the North West. I call Mr Leslie Cree. Mr Principal Deputy Speaker, I was wondering if the Minister envisages that pilots such as the pop-up investment uh, office, which I understand is going to Limavady. Um, could this stimulate the sort of business activity uh, which some elected representatives complain about the lack of? Well, certainly um, the pop up shop uh, from Invest Northern Ireland has visited, um, I think it was Queen Street in Belfast, uh, then it went to Inniskillen to the Ironside Shopping Centre, and then it's going uh, to Limavady as well. And that's really uh, an effort of Invest Northern Ireland to make people aware of what's available uh, in terms of help, in terms of programme, in terms of assistance. Uh, and I have been pleased, I haven't had the feedback uh, from the full feedback from Inniskillen yet, but apparently, in respect of the uh, Queen Street, uh, I think it was in Queen's Arcade in um, Belfast, that was a very good engagement. People coming in through the doors learning about Invest Northern Ireland, what they were doing for the very first time, and I can see us doing more of that uh, because sometimes the message doesn't seem to be getting out there, um, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker, in relation to what Invest actually gets involved in, and I'm very keen to make sure that everybody is aware of what's available. Mr George Robinson. Mr Deputy Speaker, could I ask the Minister <coughs> how important is the one plan in growing in the North West economy? Well, the one plan, of course, is uh, something that has been developed uh, by a number of stakeholders in the Derry City Council region, and it's something that we have been involved in from an Invest Northern Ireland perspective. It's something that the executive has endorsed as well. So it is a very important plan. I think it's a very good example of a holistic approach to how things can be achieved and moved on. Uh, it's a very positive way to look at development uh, in an area, because what you're actually doing is taking in a whole range of factors, not just dealing with factors on their own at particular points in time. So I do think that the one plan is a good example. It's one example of how to deal with things. Another example is the Fermanagh Omagh region and what they're doing there with their smart region work. And uh, it's something obviously I've been heavily involved with as well. An attempt to say this is what we envisage for the region. Now how can you help us to deliver that? I think that's a very good example of how to do things. Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, can I thank the Minister for answers uh, thus far? Um, can I ask her, in, in relation to Fort George and the opportunities there, we had a good announcement last week around, uh, one, around I think, about 10 jobs for a local company. Uh, can she just tell us what work Invest Northern Ireland is doing to attract investors to that site and to any other uh, vacant sites in the city? Again, it's about uh, being aware of what's available uh, for inward investors, but also for indigenous companies, so that when they ask us questions about particular needs that we know where those needs can be satisfied and of course Fort George is a very good site, it's very uh, central to the city uh, but has plenty of space on it as well uh, and of course it's got the uh, Hibernia link uh, into it as well which of course is a very strong selling point. So Invest Northern Ireland in its property uh, division is very much aware of Fort George and of course at a local office level in Londonderry they're very much aware of it as well. Roy Beggs. Question number six. <clears throat> Under the Mineral Development Act 1969, DETI has powers to grant licenses for the prospecting and mining of selected minerals, including salt, in Northern Ireland. 
My department has granted a mineral prospecting license to Electric Development Limited to explore for suitable salt beds for its proposed compressed air energy storage project. Subsequent solution mining of the salt to create caverns would require a mining license from my department. In addition, Island McGee Storage Limited has a mineral prospecting license for salt exploration on Island McGee. However, as the Mineral Development Act only applies to onshore Northern Ireland, the company would need a Detty mining license for the creation of natural gas storage caverns beneath Larne Lock. Would not need a Detty mining license for the creation of natural cavern uh, beneath Larne Lock. Thank you. And uh, that ends the period for oral questions. We now move on to topical questions, and I call Mr. David McNary. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. On the issue scripted by the media as tensions in East Belfast, the news today is about 500 imported labour jobs relative to 150 local jobs employed in Harland and Wolfe. Does the Minister agree that the company involved should clarify if there is a disparity in the numbers employed outside the local unemployment and employment register? I uh, thank the member for his uh, question, and uh, it's one I thought he might raise with me when I seen his name uh, on the list uh, today. And so I asked some questions of Harland and Wolfe uh, before I came to the House today. Uh, as I understand it, Harland and Wolfe were awarded the contract for the dry docking of uh, the rig uh, by an international oil group, Dolphin Drilling, in August of last year. Uh, it is a very big contract. Uh, but initially it was only uh, a 60-day contract and uh, it had a very short turnaround, um, required a very swift response uh, by Harland and Wolfe in order to secure uh, the work into uh, the shipyard and therefore they had to react very quickly to secure and provide the necessary workshops uh, uh, and short-term contracts. And these are uh, short-term contracts, although I do acknowledge that it has gone on beyond 60 days. And in many ways, uh, the wider economy in Belfast has benefited from the fact that it has gone on longer than 60 days. And indeed, I know, for example, uh, a lot of the hospitality industry has really benefited uh, from the fact that the, these workers are, are here. Uh, Harlan & Wolfe has uh, brought in, I am told, 600 temporary workers uh, to complete the renewal, upgrade and maintenance of the work on time. Uh, and these are estimated figures, and uh, Mr McNary might have different figures to me, but uh, I am told that there were 200 from Northern Ireland Labour Pool, uh, 200 from the Scotland and North East of England uh, Labour Pool, and the balance made up from uh, European um, countries. And we should ask the question, why is that the case? And it is the case, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker, that uh, there was a shortage of skilled steel workers uh, in, uh, and welders in Northern Ireland following the decline of the shipbuilding industry. And that raises the question then, should we be doing something in relation to the skills of people in that area and generally in Northern Ireland? And that is something I certainly am happy to have a conversation with the Dale Minister about. Minister, and I call Mr McNally for sub. I thank the Minister and I do appreciate the comprehensive answer and the diligence that she showed in uh, sourcing um, at, at least some indication as to uh, what this contract is about. Um, I'm not going to argue with her, but I, I do think that there's more uh, to be told about this. Could I ask her, uh, therefore, uh, Deputy Principal Speaker, that when in the future the Minister announces and there will all be welcome news of job creation, Will she mean jobs to reduce our unemployment figures or the unemployment in other countries? Well, of course, uh, the member knows I didn't announce these jobs. Um, and if he would care to go back and look, he... Uh, no, well, you, you made the point that uh, if I make job announcements, will I ensure that they are jobs for Northern Ireland people? I didn't, of course, uh, announce these jobs because I was very much aware at the time that it was a short-term uh, contract and therefore whoever was going to fill these jobs, they were going to be short-term uh, jobs and they weren't going to be permanent jobs and, and therefore uh, I think he, he should look at that point in particular. Uh, but of course we are very aware that when companies uh, come into Northern Ireland, talking from a foreign direct investment point of view now, that they will on occasion bring some people with them to embed the new company into Northern Ireland and I think it is wrong for us 
to say that we only want jobs in Northern Ireland for Northern Ireland people. We want people to come to Northern Ireland and share their skills and experiences with us in Northern Ireland to build up the Northern Ireland workforce so that we can be competitive and global. And I think it's wrong to say that we're only interested in jobs here for people from Northern Ireland. Thank you. And I call Ms Judith Cochrane. Thank you, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker. Um, can I ask the Minister to update the House on the current status of the Agri-Food Loan Scheme and which banks are participating? Well, the, uh, I'm very pleased to say that the uh, first broiler phase of the scheme is now open for business. Uh, it took a little longer than some of us would have liked, but it is now open for business, and the first loan under the scheme has been approved by the First Trust Bank. So they are the bank that get the gold star because they are the ones that made the, the first loan. The participating banks are the Bank of Ireland, Barclays, uh, Danske Bank, First Trust Bank, and the Ulster Bank. Mrs. Cochrane, for a supplement. Thank you, and thank the Minister for her answer. Um, can I ask the Minister if there are any plans to roll this um, type of scheme out to any other sectors? Well, yes, there are, and uh, this really was uh, a pilot scheme, if you like, because we recognised that was, there, were, there was very much a need in this sector, given the growth uh, of the poultry sector and the fact that a lot of farmers didn't have the requisite security that they needed to access uh, money from uh, traditional loans and traditional banks and therefore we came in uh, and uh, with this very innovative scheme ensured that we have got the participation of the banks that I have listed and actually it meant that the banks are now more engaged than ever with this industry and uh, the broiler section has been the first sector uh, to have benefited but I have hopes that it will be used wider in the poultry sector and indeed maybe in the pork sector and other sectors in agri as well. And I call Mr. Trevor Clark. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker. Um, can I be on record, maybe, for congratulating the Minister in terms of the work that she's doing for tourism in Northern Ireland, particularly in relation to announcements the last couple of weeks in ter terms of the Irish Open over a couple of years and the, uh, the Giro, which is probably coming much sooner than the Irish Open. But in terms of the Giro, can the Minister tell us the House or tell the House today in terms of the value? or what that actually means to Northern Ireland, given that some people would rather focus on the negatives as opposed to the positives. Well, I thank him for his comments in relation uh, to the events that we have been able to announce over this past short period of time. It is tremendous to welcome the Irish Open back to Northern Ireland in 2015 uh, to Royal County Down, and then in 2017 to the Lockerham Golf Resort in Enniskillen. Uh, we have, of course, been launching the Circuit of Ireland, uh, which takes place over the Easter weekend, Another very strong uh, race, uh, one that uh, really has taken on a new emphasis because of the fact that Eurosport are involved and it's part of a European network now. And of course the North West 200 which we launched uh, yeah. as well. Uh, it's uh, upping again into a festival. Uh, we very much look forward to that event uh, which is happening over a week uh, in May as well. There's a lot of things happening in uh, May, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, not least the Giro d'Italia, as I've already indicated. And uh, we have been working very hard with the team in Shade Tree Sports and RCS, the organisers, to make sure that we get the greatest benefit uh, out of the Giro d'Italia. And uh, the working groups are working uh, hard with local councils to try and make sure that they can capitalise um, on the Giro and the opportunities that that brings to local areas as well. We have a full branding campaign that's going to run alongside uh, the whole of the event right along uh, the course. And uh, we have been promoting the event to our key consumer markets uh, in Northern Ireland, in the Republic of Ireland, and right across Europe. So it is going to be a tremendous event for us, and uh, I look forward to it very much. Clark, for a supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Principal Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for that answer. And given the success that bringing the Irish Open back, and now we have the Giro d'Italia coming next month, what is the possibility, uh, Minister, in the future of bringing it back? Given that uh, I think the, the impression that we get within our constituencies of the uh, excitement for many people to actually see it for the first time in Northern Ireland, what is the possibility of it coming back to Northern Ireland? And even in terms of when it does come back, if it comes back, rather, the possibility of opening up other parts of Northern Ireland in terms of the roads or other parts of the province for people to see and enjoy what we have over here? 
I thank the member for his question, and he is right to talk about well, what happens after the race has been here, uh, what's the legacy behind it. Uh, and in actual fact, the Giro d'Italia do have a very strong legacy programme, uh, and I've already had representations from South Down uh, in relation to the legacy programme, uh, in terms of the Grand Fondo, as it's called, uh, because they run races uh, in the following years, which really get the community involved. Uh, in the Giro brand and keep cycling alive and uh, having met uh, with some of the cycling groups across Northern Ireland it is quite amazing to see the number of people uh, who are involved in cycling across Northern Ireland so this is a great event for them of course but it's a great event for our tourists who we look forward to welcoming in May as well. And I call Mr Alec Maskey. Can I ask the Minister to uh, if she could give us an appraisal of the uh, recent uh, NICFA commentary around what they describe as significant gaps in terms of economic data in respect of being able to plan for a recovery. Well, we uh, hope to provide uh, some answers to that, although I don't believe there are gaps, but there will be some clarity provided in that in terms of uh, what the executive plans to do over the uh, next period of time because there are a lot of figures out there. Some of them, some of them uh, are very misleading. All I know is the fact that uh, we now are down 13 million in terms of, or 15 million in terms of our budget, 13 million in terms of our budget uh, for the Northern Ireland Executive, and that's gone. That's gone. Uh, so therefore, we have to look at our budget in the years to come, and I know that will be a huge challenge, particularly for the high spending uh, departments in the Northern Ireland Executive and uh, it's going to be a huge challenge to deal with. However, I do hope that when we have those figures uh, in front of people that they do realise that the money has gone and therefore we need to start planning for the future of Northern Ireland. We've been told that we've been living in a period of austerity, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker, but frankly, if we go on the way we're going in terms of welfare reform, we ain't seen nothing yet. Mr Maskey for a supplement. Uh, well, actually, I can't thank the Minister for that response because it's just silly posturing and uh, it doesn't at, at all address the question. Uh, I would have expected the Minister to tell the House that she's very much committed to making sure that we do have all the necessary information that we can get at our disposal to plan for an economic recovery. So could the Minister even at this point uh, leave aside a stupid posturing and actually try and give a, an, an assurance to the House that you might actually understand the need to have a full framework for data might help. Oh, well, it that. takes one to know one. Um, can I say this to the member? He obviously didn't uh, listen to the answer I gave him, and I don't know why that uh, might be a problem for him. I did say that the executive, the executive of which his party uh, are members, as far as I can recall, have agreed to look at the specific figures in relation uh, to welfare reform and indeed all of the difficulties in front of it. And he think, if he thinks it's silly posturing. <laughs> and if he thinks it's silly posturing planning for the future when we're down £13 million, then let him speak of his economic illiteracy to the people of Northern Ireland. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Uh, there is uh, Invest Northern Ireland development land, the land bank held in Bangor at Blue for a long time now, and nothing has happened with it. Um, would the Minister advise that she would think favourably about allowing local authorities to become involved so, in fact, that this asset could be utilised for economic development? Uh, indeed, um, when he looks at the transfer of powers going down after the local government reform, he will find that part of that is local economic development and I would very much welcome the engagement with the local councils in terms of land banks because it's local people who know A, where the land is, B, what the need is in terms of indigenous companies. Uh, so very much commit to him that I will do that and I'm happy to have a discussion with him if he feels that it would be good to have an early discussion uh, in and around that in terms of Baloo. Call Mr Creed for supplementary. Yes, well, Principal Deputy Speaker, I uh, knock my question and supplement the end of one, but I'm very pleased with the response from the Minister. Thank you, and thank you. I call Mr Allegis. Can I ask the Minister what will be the impact of the opening of the new premises for Monster Sims that the Minister opened in Bangor? 
Now, I was very pleased to be down uh, in Bangor uh, again with Munster Sims to see the development that has been ongoing there. As he will know, uh, Munster Sims was a management buyout a couple of years ago and uh, perhaps at a very difficult time for the economy, uh, a team there decided to grow that business uh, and they have done so in a very impressive way. I want to congratulate the management team at Monster Sims for their new factory, which I was uh, very privileged to open recently, but also to pay tribute to their staff. And I know that the management would want me to pay tribute to their staff because they have a very good uh, working relationship. Indeed, uh, they were named as a Sunday Times Employer of the Year uh, for, I think, it's five years, which is something uh, that is uh, something to be very proud of. And the fact that one of our companies and one of uh, your companies, Mr. Mr. Easton is on that list should be something that you're very proud of. And, uh, members, that his time is up, and uh, I propose.